All right, well, welcome everyone to today's CPH review session. Uh, my name is Ashley Mueller. I'm the manager of educational programs. And so we welcome you back for those of you who've been here the last few sessions. Um, just as always, I'm going to say it again. Um, I'll monitor the chat and Q&A throughout the presentation uh, so you can continue to act, uh, continue to um, interact with your fellow audience members. Um, if you do have questions, please make sure to use that Q&A section so that we can answer those um, at the Q&A sections. Um, so our last winner of the CPH um, APHA exam review guide was Teresa Tress Cornelius. Um, so congratulations to Teresa. We will be raffling off another copy today um, to one participant who's here live in the um, webinar. So then let's move on to today's topic, uh, which is program planning and evaluation presented by Molly, Molly Pulverento. Molly is a senior outreach specialist in the Department of Family Medicine at uh, Michigan State University. In this role, she coordinates activities between the departments and community partners, including local and state public health departments. Molly serves as the executive manager of the Michigan Association of Preventative Medicine and Public Health Physicians, the statewide um, association of physicians working in governmental and academic public health. She is also the director of the department's Family Medicine Res Residency Network, where she has worked with programs to develop curricular and scholarly projects related to leadership, public health, population health, and community medicine. Prior to coming to MSU, Molly worked in public health policy, program evaluation, and program management with state-focused nonprofit organizations. She has served in leadership roles in the Michigan Public Health Association, the Ingram County Board of Health, and the American Public Health Association, where she currently serves on their education board. Molly earned her master's in education in higher education administration from Illinois State University in 1999, where she focused on the role of volunteerism and student learning in higher education. She earned her CPH uh, in 2015. So with that, I'd like to pa pass it over to Molly uh, for today's presentation. Thank you, Ashley. I always forget like what was in the bio and I'm like, oh, wait, yeah, <laughs> I've done some of those things. So welcome everybody. I'm going to Share my screen here in just a second. So um, it always takes that minute, but I'm just excited to see all the people that are, um, the numbers that are here today. Um, I'm jealous of those of you in warmer climates because I am in Michigan and we just got more snow today after some of our snow had melted. Um, so all of you seeing sunshine today, I'm very jealous. Um, and uh, so send some this way, if you can up to Michigan. I know it's January, but we're already missing seeing that bright ball in the sky. Um, I do want to say, and uh, as we set the stage, um, that my goal is to make sure you leave here after these two hours and feel like you have a good understanding of these topics that we're going to talk about with program planning and evaluation. Um, I'm going to review both the content from the exam. We're going to go over practice questions, um, but please make sure you're asking any questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, Ashley's going to keep an eye on that. We'll try to answer um, as many questions as we can over the course of these two hours. I know when um, I took the CPH exam uh, in 2015, I was actually part of the pilot cohort of individuals who did not have their MPH, but had um, years of experience working in the field um, who were allowed to take the exam. Uh, it was really kind of the first time they let people without the MPH do this. And I was really excited um, to have that opportunity. I was excited to pass and earn my CPH. Um, and so I'm glad to be able to give back and help those that are looking to take the exam, uh, hopefully here in the near future. So we're gonna talk today about program planning and evaluation. And I will say that, um, you know, it's a cycle and one feeds into the other. And so, um, We'll go through program planning and we'll talk about that for a little bit and we'll have some questions. Um, I'll have some practice questions for you. And then um, you'll have a chance to ask questions of me around program planning, but know then that kind of with program planning comes evaluation because it really is a cycle and you're learning from what you've done in prior programs to inform future programs. And so really you can't do one well without the other. Um, so we're going to start in our discussion today around program planning and some models and the content on the exam around program planning. 
um, but know that we're going to get into evaluation and really talk about this as a cycle. The one thing I really like about this diagram on this slide is that it shows kind of the terms that we use at different levels. So when we talk about assessment as part of the program planning cycle, you know, our community health assessment might be what we're talking about at the community level, or we're looking at an organizational or a needs assessment um, kind of at a smaller level. Whatever we call it, it's this idea of gathering data to help us to define the issue that we're wanting to address through a program. Um, we also use that same data to help us prioritize those issues. Um, I know that's a big part of a community health um, needs assessment is then that prioritization in the community. And that's what then informs the plan that is created. You also do the same thing in an organization. You have to look at um, all the information you have to prioritize. What is most important? What can have the biggest impact on um, the issue that we're trying to address? Obviously you have to have a plan to do programs successfully, um, it's important that everybody understands what it is that we're gonna try to do. And so there's a plan that helps to describe the implementation, our goals, what we're gonna measure, um, you know, how often are we gonna measure it so that we can come in and, and decide, yes, this is working, no, this is, isn't, here's how we're gonna make some changes. What strategies are we gonna use at first? Who has to be around the table? All of that is a key part of a plan. And then obviously the implementation, which circles right back into the assessment and that evaluation piece. So just keep in mind that it really is a cycle. Sometimes it's hard. It's always hard to do a presentation on program planning and evaluation because it feels like we're jumping into the middle of a process no matter where in the cycle that we're starting. The other thing that's really important though is make sure um, as you're doing this, and, I, and I'm gonna bring this up several times, that as you're thinking about program planning, as you're thinking about program evaluation, your community, your partners really have to be at the core of all of that activity. Um, your program and your evaluations are not gonna be successful if you don't have those important stakeholders as part of your team. So just something to keep in mind. So first I'm gonna go over kind of the content list. So these are some of the things that um, are part of the content for the CPH exam. So in program planning, um, the questions, um, you know, might discuss how you apply uh, evidence-based practices to program planning, implementation and evaluation. How do you identify challenges to program implementation? ensuring that program implementation occurs as intended. So that's a lot of kind of thinking forward, being proactive and thinking through what some of those barriers might be. How do you plan evidence-based interventions to meet established program goals and objectives? And part of the challenge sometimes is finding that evidence-based intervention and making sure that that evidence-based intervention is appropriate for the community that you are seeking to, to work with and to serve which gets into designing context-specific health interventions based upon situational analysis and organizational goals. So it may be that you've found a great intervention, a great program, but hasn't been tried with the population that you're wanting to work with. And you think this is gonna be great and it'll work really well, but you might need to tweak some of the pieces. Maybe it's a type two diabetes prevention program um, that hasn't been tried with this particular population, how do you tweak some of the, the recipes, some of the nutrition education that's involved? How do you tweak some of the um, education around physical activity to make sure it's appropriate for the community um, in which it's being given? Making sure then that you implement context-specific health interventions based upon that same situation analysis and organizational goals. So it's not just enough to design and to tweak those interventions, but then how can you implement it in a way that still stays true to that evidence-based design, but reflects the context in which the, the program is being delivered. Um, plan and communicate steps and procedures for the planning, implementation, and evaluation of health programs, policies, and interventions. That's a big bullet, and there's a lot there. But really thinking through all of the steps for implementation and evaluation of your programs and policies and interventions, making sure you have a plan and thinking who helps to create that plan to make sure it can actually be carried out. Um, again, designing action plans for enhancing community or population-based health evaluate personal material resources. This is one of those um, aspects of program planning that can be really difficult and can be a sticking point. How do we 
honestly evaluate the capacity of our personnel to do this program. We might think it's important and we might have some really key folks who agree that it's important, but they are already overcommitted, whether they're our volunteers or our staff. So how can we honestly evaluate that time and resource that we have? How can we um, really understand the material resources that are available either from our community partners or through our home agency? How do we use available evidence to inform effective teamwork and team-based practices? How do we prioritize individual, organizational, or community concerns and resources for a health program? That is a difficult part of any program, whether you're planning it or implementing. How do we all agree on those priorities? Um, you know, when you get community partners around a table, when you get people around a table, and they can all look at the same data, but if there's something that's really important to them, sometimes it's a hard conversation of of what's good for one organization or one partner maybe isn't reflected as as what everybody needs. And so, how do you um, make those decisions? given the relationships that you need to maintain, given some of the political dynamics in your community, um, that prioritization process can be complicated and it's something to think through as you're thinking about the data that you collect to, to shape your program um, and, and how you work with your community partners in a way that establishes trust and make sure that people know that their feedback when provided is listened to. Um, Design public health interventions that incorporate factors such as gender, race, poverty, history, migration, or culture within public health systems, and develop a community health plan based on needs and resource assessments. So these are, um, the, this is the content outline for what is part of program planning um, for the CPH exam. And there's a lot there. And, and so we're gonna touch on some of these main points and hopefully cover a lot of these bullets. But if there's anything that we don't cover or you feel like you've got a burning question about, again, please feel free to use the chat and the Q&A and we will get to it here in a few minutes. So if you don't see it in the slides, please make sure you ask. So again, I, I told you I'm gonna say this multiple times. It's really important for program planning and evaluation for all parts of that cycle to be a community driven process. It is important to engage and to fully engage stakeholders throughout the whole process, um, including members of that of your target community or your target population, the staff who will actually implement the program. I don't know about all of you, but I have been part of teams before where um, everybody's coming up with a great project and the people who are gonna be implementing it are not at the table. Um, and so the folks who are coming up with the program often think that those individuals have a whole lot of free time and nothing else to think about or worry about or no other responsibilities. And so sometimes it's important to make sure that the people who will actually implement the program, who understand some of the barriers and challenges in implementing a program, such as what you're talking about, are part of all of the planning and the evaluation because they are likely to be the ones also collecting the data. Um, make sure that you have people who have influence in the community that you are targeting or who can influence change. Sometimes this means policymakers. Um, sometimes this means um, business community, those who have resources to share, but finding those people who can influence a change, who can make sure that you can get that community support to put a change into place, um, who sometimes understand parts of the community that maybe you don't have influence in and they understand the dynamics and how that will work and what will be successful and what won't. You need to make sure your funding agencies and partners are part of the process um, and that any other organizational partners, particularly their leaders, um, have, have a place and have a say in how things are evolving. Um, it is a frequent, a, a common pitfall to have um, people at the table who are really excited about something and who start to make commitments for something but don't necessarily have the authority to make that commitment. So it's important to understand who is at your table, what kind of authority do they have within their organization or within their community, what kind of commitments can they truly make so that you aren't over-promising um, in some situations. Most importantly, frequently look at your partners, look around that table, and ask who's missing, whose voice is missing, whose perspective is missing. Um, and, and look at who shows up. I think a lot of the times when we put together a program, 
we've invited people and they're like, yep, we're supportive. We can't make this meeting, but they haven't made a meeting in six months. Think about how do you get somebody from that organization? Maybe not that person, but somebody who works with them. How do you get that voice at a table in a different way? Um, because quite often decisions are made and then it's months into the process and you realize this key partner really hasn't had a voice in the process. So let's talk about, in general, a program planning process. There are lots of models. Um, they all have common elements. And so I think this is probably the, the most important piece, but there are lots of models out there. Um, every planning model starts off with some sort of data about what is needed, whether it's called a needs assessment or something else. Um, it's really critical to be successful in program planning to know why you need a program. Sometimes it's like, oh, there's this great grant opportunity and it, this would be like something really great to do. Our community would love it. We should go ahead and get this grant and we should apply for it. And then, you know, yeah, it's something they would love because it's something that's already going on in the community. So maybe there's not a need for it. Maybe um, you don't end up seeing the outcomes when you get some support for it because you were, your community was already in a pretty good place on that health outcome. So it's really important to know the why you're investing your resources, your time, your money into a program. You also need to have a resource assessment. Again, you need to know what's available to support a program from your organization, from any partners, and the resources, think broadly when you think resources. You have to think time, think expertise, Think obviously funding, that's always the big one, but not just funding, but what do people already have? What material resources? Is there space that somebody has that we can use? Does somebody have, you know, a bus that we can use? Um, you know, think about those things that already exist and how some of those things can be leveraged. Um, and you need to understand what all of those are as you, as you think about your program. And then again, a stakeholder assessment, really thinking who do we need to have involved in planning our program? Whose support do we need? Whose buy-in do we need from the beginning? Um, we all, I'm sure, have worked in communities where um, you know, there are trusted individuals and, and to, for a program to be successful, those individuals have to show support for the program. Um, and so you really need to understand your community and who to have as part of the program. So like I said, by any other name, needs assessments can be called a whole bunch of different things. They can be called community health assessments, a community analysis, community diagnosis, um, regardless of what we call them. The purpose of a needs assessment is to inform, um, you know, you and your partners of what's needed in your community and to help, you know, prioritize those um, needs and to come up with some goals. Sometimes your needs assessment is part of your evaluation from a previous project. So it isn't necessarily called a needs assessment, but you're gathering the data of what's needed next as part of your evaluation from a previous program. So don't overlook those data sources from previous efforts um, to, to understand what the next step should be. Okay. So to understand you know, a needs assessment, they're gonna have you answer a needs assessment, whatever it's called will help you to answer some key questions. Again, the what. What is the need in your targeted community or population? And what are the current resources and interventions? It also ask who. So you may have a, a geographic community that you are serving, but who within that geographic area has a greater need than the community or the population as a whole? Even if you're looking at a particular population, um, if, you know, I'm in Michigan, I am not far from um, Southeast Michigan, the Metro Detroit area where we have a significant um, Middle Eastern um, and North African immigrant population. Um, but even within that larger community, there are specific subpopulations, particularly some of our most recent immigrants that have a greater need relate to a whole lot of uh, health questions. They have a greater need than the population as a whole. So how do we even drill down sometimes a little bit further within um, communities, within populations to find those um, with the most need that we still believe we could reach given the resources we have? Where? So 
not only where is the population located, where do they live and work, but where do they currently go to seek services? Um, and what are the current resources or, or those interventions? Where are they located? Um, again, I'll use our Middle Eastern North African population in Southeast Michigan as an example. Um, there is a great community, there are several great community partners in Southeast Michigan that work very closely with our local health departments, our state health departments, academic partners. Um, they are a trusted hub, a trusted source of all sorts of information for this community. They are the first organization that many new immigrants to the community hear about because they are just known for providing services and helping people get settled into this country. And so you want, you need to have them as a partner because their where is where people are gonna come anyway. Um, the when, you know, is this a program that's needed year round or only during specific times? Um, what are the times that would work best for the program to be available in this community or population? Do you need to avoid certain days, certain times? Um, are there others that are more likely to be successful? Um, you know, we have a significant migrant population on the west side of Michigan who comes and works at our farms and our orchards. Um, Many of those interventions are provided at the times when we have the most migrant workers, although we do have some that are here a good chunk of the year. Um, but, you know, you see the ramp up of the services and the interventions for that population um, starting in March and going through um, October when the population is the highest. And again, the times that work best for that program, for that intervention, is actually towards the evening after the work's been done for the day. So it's understanding the 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 daily routine of the population, the weekly routine, those you know important events, what's going on um, to know the best when. Why? So why is the intervention needed? What is that underlying factor? Why is this community experiencing this problem? The why can help you to identify um, what intervention you choose um, to try to change them, to change that underlying cause and how. So what's been done so far? To address this concern in the community. What's been successful? What hasn't been successful? Um, what does the community want and need for an intervention to be successful? Quite often, um, we can look at the how um, and think we know the how based on what we've done in other places. But if we don't listen to the community and how they say it should be done, um, then it's less likely to be successful. So I joke that this is six easy steps. Um, needs assessments, depending on how large, how broad of a needs assessment you're trying to do, they can take a whole lot of time, a lot of resources, a lot of energy. Um, for any of you who have been involved in a community health uh, needs assessment, uh, if you work at a local health department or state health department, those are year long processes and you're trying to identify existing data sources as well as who can we get data from in our community that maybe we don't already have? Um, so really that, that first step is the most important, which is what's the scope and the purpose of your needs assessment? Do you need to do a community health needs assessment? Do you need that really broad um, picture? Or can you look at a specific issue within your community? Can you look at housing and quality housing? Or are you looking at rental housing and how many rental houses are you looking at, um, you know, the complaints for um, code violations? Or do you need to collect information on um, how often the rentals are turned over or looking for bed bug infestations or all sorts of things. So really being critical about the scope and the purpose of the needs assessment. I, my, one of my first jobs in public health was working on program and evaluation and um, truly believe my most successful evaluations were when we were very narrow and specific in what we asked. You Sometimes it's like, oh, it'd be great to know this, but you don't wanna overstep. Really be specific about the scope and the purpose because you'll make the most effective use of the resources you have to conduct your needs assessment. That feeds into two, determine the data you need to meet the goal of your needs assessment. Is this existing data or do you need to collect the data? If you have a narrow scope and purpose that fits what it is you think you want to do, and you can say, there's this existing data source, we just got to look at it differently, or we got to ask some different questions, do some different analysis, 
that's a different proposition than saying we need to go out and conduct focus groups or do some surveys or some, you know, some other data collection in the community. Both are important. And it's important to not just define your scope and purpose because you know some of the data exists, but it's understanding what you're trying to do and what your resources are for a needs assessment to make sure that if there's data that exists and you can use it in a way that's appropriate, that sometimes is, is a more straightforward and um, I was gonna say less time consuming, but it depends on how you're gonna look at the data, but it can be helpful if there's some data that already exists. So again, you're gonna have to analyze the data, whether it's new data you collect or data that's already out there. And you wanna make sure that analysis matches your scope and purpose and goal, the needs assessment. Interpreting the data is where you really want to get your community members and your partners involved. Um, because it's important that they look at that and say, well, I know the data says this, but where is this from? Because this isn't what I see in my community. This has happened um, when I've been involved in our local community health needs assessment process is that we've use our local data sources and then some of our communities at highest need are saying, but that's not what we see. And so we really have to go back and look at those original data sources and how well are they actually reaching our target populations. And it's it's caused us to really look back at interpreting the data and, and what's the difference of the data um, depending on who's been asked. Use those results to prioritize the program focus, um, thinking about what other programs and resources already exist. And then confirm with that focus that everybody agrees upon it. So that everybody's been heard, everybody's been part of that interpretation and prioritization process. And then everybody's kind of agreed on what the highest needs are coming out of your needs assessment. So like I said, I put easy in parentheses because this is not easy. This is hard work. This is can be very time consuming work depending on how big of a population or how big of a community or how big of a needs assessment you're trying to do but they're really important steps. And they can be, if, if you do this well, your program is, is um, in really good shape to be successful. So I wanna make sure we talk about some different planning models. Um, the goal of all these models is to make sure that you have um, engaged the community and the target population in the program planning. So all of these models incorporate community members in different ways. They range from some really simple models, um, which I'm sure a lot of you will have seen and be familiar with, um, to more complex. And of course, the more complex the model, it involves more time and sources, you know, data sources and resources. Um, but we're going to talk about these because I know they've been known to show up on the CPDH exam in the past, and I want to make sure that you at least have seen them somewhere. So the first we're going to talk about is a SWOT analysis, um, which is probably the simplest. Um, there's also the patch model, which is a planned approach to community health. There's the APEX PH, which is assessment protocol for excellence in public health. There's the MAP, which is mobilizing for action through planning and partnerships. There's MAP IT, uh, mobilize, assess, plan, implement, and track. And then the precede and proceed model. So first, SWOT analysis. Um, we use this all the time in my academic department for really quick um, kind of not full strategic planning, but just kind of check in, where are we, what's coming up? Uh, we do this all the time. So it's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, and it relies on those stakeholders you have around the table with their experiences, expertise, their familiarity with local data and trends. So this isn't one where you're going out and seeking data sources, where you're doing some initial analysis. It's really the people around the table. What is it that you're seeing every day? Um, and you're relying on those key informants. So it's some good information. It's usually relatively quick to act on it. Um, it's been really good when we're looking at those fun turnaround, really quick grant opportunities where you have, you know, 30 days to try to write something. Um, but it's not the best data. You might not have all the right people around the table. So you need to take this kind of analysis with a grain of salt. It's kind of a nice way to brainstorm almost and think about, well, what do you see, you know, and and get some sort of direction. Um, but very rarely, especially with program planning, um, do we use this and only this. Quite often, this is a jumping off point and we use it and then um, look at further needs assessment work 
um, and program planning uh, before we actually put something into the field. One that I know if you work in governmental public health, you have seen this and the new version of it is the MAP and MAP 2.0. So this is the model that was developed by the National Association of City and County Health Officials. Um, it is used by many, many, many governmental public health agencies, particularly for their community health assessment process and the development of community health improvement plans or CHIPS. Um, it was updated, actually, it was updated in 2023, so I need to change that last bullet. I apologize. I keep forgetting I'm in denial that it's 2024, um, but the updated version was released within the last year. And so in this model, um, again, you're seeing... Um, kind of all sorts of different assessment, assessment of community themes and strengths, local public health system assessment, community health status assessment, forces of change assessment. So those are three, those are four different types of assessments. You're looking at different things with each of those, but all of them feed into this, how you organize for success. What's that partnership development? Everybody works together on visioning, then on those assessments, identifying their strategic issues, formulating your goals and strategies, and then you get into that cycle of evaluate, plan, and implement. But all around this whole model with the arrows showing kind of the process to move through, you still have these assessments going on. You have to understand what are the forces of change in your, in your community as you're going through this whole process. Um, so this... Um, the biggest critique of the original one is that parts of it were were could be onerous, especially for local health departments. Um, I know they the MAP 2.0 seeks to address some of that feedback and to make some pieces of it a little bit more straightforward, a little bit easier, um, while still achieving um, the goals of this model, which is to think of all of these external pieces. You know, what are the strengths in your community? What is your community health status? understanding how your local public health system influences all of these things while you work through that process. Um, I think all of us probably have, if we you know, are around governmental public health or just in our communities coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, understand, can understand how all of those forces, all of those pieces affect how our uh, public health systems function, how successful they are. So this is probably the most complicated that you would see. This is the precede seed proceed model. Um, so it starts up in the top right with proceed. So these are the evaluation tasks. And it, it really starts with specifying measurable objectives and baselines. So doing that phase one is that social assessment, which is a you know a needs assessment. Um, and then you're doing your epidemi epidemiological assessment, excuse me. So looking at the existing data sources after doing this kind of community social scan, then you're doing an educational and ecological assessment. And then phase four is administrative and policy assessment and intervention alignment. What I love about this model is that you kind of get all of the data, you understand all of the systems, you look at all of those support pieces, and then you look at your policies and your administrative rules. Because is there something in our policy that maybe we could change before we try an intervention? Because the last thing you want to do is put an intervention into place, a program into place, where there's already something structurally that's going to be a barrier to that program. So thinking about how you would align policy with the intervention that you're aiming for. And so sometimes it's changing policy and your administrative rules. Sometimes it's changing the intervention to match what already exists because changing policy and changing rules can be difficult. Um, so you get through that precede, all those early planning, understanding your data, thinking through the systems. Um, before you ever get to phase five, which is implementation of the health program. They include in here both educational strategies as well as policy regulation organization. So again, thinking through both this individual level, that educational strategy and the policy level, the structural systemic um, side of a program implementation. We get into um, the process evaluation. You're looking at things that predispose individuals to behavior, that reinforce behaviors, or that enable behaviors. 
And then you're also looking at multiple levels of genetics, behavior, and environment, all of which feed into health and then quality of life. As you'll see at the bottom here, starting in the bottom left, after implementation in phase five, you have a process evaluation, an impact evaluation, and an outcome evaluation. When we talk about program evaluation in a few minutes, we'll get into a little bit about these different types of evaluation and evaluating at different points in the process. Um, but I want you to, to see that those are also part of this model. Ideally, um, when you use a proceed preseed, um, you know, it's shaped like a U on there in the orange that goes around the side. For most program planning models, it wouldn't be a U, it would be a square. So what you learn from these evaluations feeds back up into those, particularly into the social assessments and the educational and ecological assessments. Um, but this is this model specifically looks at program planning um, and the evaluation of a specific program, not how it feeds back into the next round. I know there's a lot there. I know that's a busy slide. <laughs> so choosing an intervention. This feels like it should be easy and it is not. Um, you know, in choosing an intervention, the question is, do we create something new or do we adopt something that already is developed? And it depends. Because is there an evidence-based intervention that is specific to your need, that addresses your area of focus, and or has shown success with your population of focus? If you find a program that both addresses your need and your population, and you can afford it, because sometimes those interventions have costs, go for it. Um, quite often what happens, at least in my experience, is you find an intervention that's one or the other. It either addresses my need, but it hasn't been used with my population, or it's been used with my population, but doesn't quite address what I need it to address. Um, and so then the question becomes, is this an intervention that we can adapt um, to fit our specific needs? And some interventions, some evidence-based interventions out there, you can adapt, um, but others are very their outcomes are very specifically tied to how it's implemented, to that fidelity to the model. And so you really need to think through how making a change, how adapting that intervention could impact the likely outcomes that you will see. But the, the other side of that is, do you have the resources, the time, the money, the expertise to develop a new intervention? Um, a lot of interventions are take a lot of time to develop. You usually want to pilot test it with a small group before you roll it out to a larger group. Um, it takes resources. It takes having people who know how to do this. And, um, and that can be really hard. That can involve a huge investment of finances and of time. Do you have the resources to adopt an evidence-based intervention? There are quite a few interventions out there that require a lot of training for the individuals who are gonna be doing the, the service provision, whatever that looks like, that require a lot of data collection um, to go back to the people who have created the, the intervention and they're trying to evaluate its success over time. Um, there can sometimes be, um, whether it's you know, copyrighted materials. So all of that can cost um, quite a bit financially. And so that also becomes a question is, do you even have the resources to put an evidence-based intervention into place? Whatever you decide to do, it's important that you make sure that any intervention is a fit for your community and the goals of your intervention. And so the best recommendation is as you're looking at options, Again, making sure that your community members, your stakeholders, the people who are part of the community that hopefully will benefit from whatever you're putting into place, it's making sure that those individuals are part of reviewing all the possible interventions and are part of making the decision of any intervention that you adopt or adapt. So with implementing an intervention, this is a lot of project management, but make sure you've got a list of everything that has to be completed. Um, for the intervention to be implemented and to be continued over time. Continue if you wanna do a pilot test. Do you wanna phase in the implementation or do you just do a full implementation of everything? 
that needs to be based on your capacity, on your resources, on what the community wants. Um, I highly recommend a timeline of activities to manage the process. It doesn't have to be overly specific. In fact, the more specific, like if you say, okay, from April 10th to April 17th, we're doing this, you need to have some flexibility because life never goes how we expect it to, neither do programs. Um, but again, having a timeline and understanding the order in which things need to happen and what needs to happen before the next step happens. And you need to make sure you know who um, will manage all the different pieces of implementation and how they're going to do it and how that progress is tracked and reported on. Having a champion and having a system for accountability is really critical. So I put in here an example of a Gantt chart, which is um, a timeline, something that um, I've used multiple times. And again, you'll see those those time frames are pretty broad, like from January to March, we're going to be doing some planting, planning. We've got some of the research on um, what exists out there, um, overlapping with the planning. We'll get into the design, whether we're doing our own or adapting something else. Then the implementation of the project, which you can see we had some overlap with the design. We were kind of tweaking those initial stages of implementation as we went. And then we had some follow-up activities um, after implementation. So this is just an example of a Gantt chart. So we're going to talk logic models, although this feeds into evaluation, but I want to introduce it here. So because, again, logic models and how we do this starts during the program planning phase. Logic models help to summarize your goals of your intervention or your program and what you expect to see. Um, the development of logic models is actually a really nice way to make sure all the stakeholders have an understanding of the primary focus of an intervention, um, as well as an agreement on the goals. So it's a way to kind of distill a lot of the needs assessment, distill your community health improvement plan, distill all of those many words of those long documents and put it into a really easy visual so everybody can go, yep, that's that's what we wanted. Because quite often you put everything in a logic model and inevitably somebody goes, no, wait, that's not what I thought we were doing. So it's, an, it's a nice way to put everything in, a, in an easy to read um, chart. And they can help in the development of the program evaluation. I wouldn't say can, they absolutely help in the development of program evaluation and in identifying which data you're gonna need to collect to assess your success in both short and long-term program goals. So almost every logic model has inputs. So it's whatever you're putting into a program or intervention, money, time, personnel, expertise, um, existing resources, community partnerships, any of those things are considered inputs. The activities are what you're going to do with those inputs listed. So if you're relying on a partner organization to promote your program, that's an activity. Um, the output is the immediate result um, of completing the activities listed. That's kind of your process evaluation. We'll get into that, but it's it's your count. We had 15 people come to this educational session. We had 202 participants in this webinar. That's an output. The outcome is how that intervention impacted those who participated in the intervention. So it would be, um, we had, um, so for my students, we had 10 students who attended all eight class sessions. We had two who didn't, and the 10 who did, did better on their final than the two who did not really easy, just kind of an outcome. But then impact or long-term outcome is really how the larger target population is impacted by the intervention or the anticipated change over time. So quite often this is looking at, um, if you're doing a diabetes education program, um, you're looking at, were they able to um, better maintain healthy A1C levels at six months, at 12 months, at 18 months? Sorry. So, Here's one logic model example. Um, so you have your inputs, the activities, um, how the activities translate into participation by the community, and then your short term, which is your outputs, your medium term outcomes and long term outcomes. I like this one because it also has a place where you can put what your assumptions are and other external factors. So your assumption may be that um, the local health department um, will be able to provide one and a half community health workers to support the education provided in this program. That's your assumption that, that they're going to be funded. Maybe, you know, so what happens if the health department, re, you know, has a funding cut and now you can't support one and a half community health workers? Um, external factors can be um, 
you know, a partner organization um, not being able to provide a meeting space anymore. It can be an unexpected end of funding. It can be a policy change. Those are things that could have, um, could be a factor in any of these outcomes. And one thing we're gonna mention is the program life cycle. It's important to plan for the end of a program when you're planning its beginning. Um, how are you gonna know when to end the program? And, you know, this is really important because in my 24 years, I have heard numerous times from my community partners that their biggest frustration is all these people who come in from outside and they have this great program and they have all this money for like two or three years. And they do this program and they do all this work and they do all this and then they disappear when the money goes away. So you really need to think, it's not just about sustainability, but how do you plan the end of the program? How might you wrap up the program and you need to think about that from the beginning, even though that's the last thing we want to think of. So how will you know when to end a program? Are you going to, you know, how will you know when your goals are met? Um, what about when the program evaluation shows that the intervention has been unsuccessful at meeting the community needs? Um, or when you can no longer adapt the intervention to meet community needs? Obviously, when the resources needed are no longer available, that kind of sometimes forces your hand. Um, but then thinking about if other community needs require resources to be shifted. So maybe the funding hasn't gone away, but there's been an emerging need in your community and, and you need to shift um, what you're using for this program someplace else. It's just, like I said, you have to think about how you wind down a program. And it's important to have those as conversations with all of your community partners as you're building the program. So that they understand that you're thinking about how can we make continued sustained change in the community? So even if this program goes away or if this program is not successful, thinking about um, what you can do, what might be next, how can we do this in a way that shows and demonstrates our commitment to this community to help address this need? Okay, that was a lot. Um, so we're gonna do a practice question. Um, practice question number one, and I know Ashley's gonna help do, I think she's gonna open up a poll. All right, so a researcher wants to conduct a study of hookah use um, in a college town and plans to use the precede proceed planning model. Um, which of the following do you think is an example of a reinforcing factor in this situation? So a reinforcing factor is something that supports a behavior decision. We'll give everyone about 25 more seconds to answer. Sounds good. Okay, everyone, like five more seconds. Okay, so a reinforcing factor um, of hookah use would actually be the fourth answer of feeling relaxed after hookah. That reinforces the behavior. People who use hookah and then feel better and feel more relaxed after using hookah, that's what's reinforcing the behavior. Um, so having multiple hookah cafes around campus isn't reinforcing, but it's part of that environmental factor. It's one of those environmental pieces um, to understand the larger environment around the behavior choice. Um, knowledge of the health effects of hookah would actually um, help to decrease the use. It would help to uh, hopefully change their behavior as well as the self-efficacy to decline using a hookah. So in the model of a pre-seed, proceed model, a reinforcing factor is something that reinforces the behavior, reinforces the decision to, to make that decision regarding whether or not to engage in that behavior. Okay. So practice question number two. A needs assessment process identifies several behavioral and environmental factors on which an intervention could potentially focus. However, to keep the project on budget, the scope of the intervention must be limited. Which of the following criteria is most important to consider 
when deciding how to focus the intervention. We'll give this one about 20 more seconds since there's a lot of rating. Yeah, I picked ones with a lot of words. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the question was, what was the answer to the first question? Someone. and that Oh, was... it was um, the feeling relaxed after using hookah, which was response number four. Is the reinforcing factor. All right, everyone, I'm going to give you five more seconds. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So you guys have picked the same two. <laughs> I always like, so the specific research, research interests of planning team members, Compliance with guidance from the project sponsor, those should not be the most important criteria. You can negotiate usually with a project sponsor and individual interest should not outweigh what needs to happen for the larger good for in the larger needs assessment. You two, pick, you guys all picked the two that I always like, I want to say, because I'm a numbers person. So I'm like, it has to be feasible within the project budget. But what I'm always reminded of is that it doesn't matter if we're within our budget, if we don't have something that has strong evidence that it can make the change we want to change. So the most important factor needs to be, do we have evidence that the desired changes can be achieved? Because if you can't, it doesn't matter if you're within your budget guidelines, guidelines because you're not going to have the evidence at the end. You're not going to have the evaluation results at the end to show that you made an impact. So you want to best position yourself when you are deciding on an intervention, you want to best position yourself with the evidence that you have with the data that you have to show that you can make an impact in the community you're targeting. So that was number two, correct? That was number two. Yep. Oh. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> All right. Number three. Easy one. Short. Which of the following strategic planning tools is in the form of a two by two table? Ten more seconds. Yep. So that SWOT chart, that strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats is a two by two table. And that is probably one of the simplest strategic planning tools you will see out there. The precede proceed is that much longer one that we showed that had kind of the U shape to it. And the Gantt chart is usually rows and columns, kind of looks like an Excel spreadsheet. You can actually easily make one in Excel. Um, a network, network diagram is usually a series of boxes and arrows showing relationships within a network. So the correct answer is three. So Ashley, I don't know what questions have popped up. If there's something yeah. to answer before we go to program evaluation specifically. Yeah, so we have a couple questions. Um, the first one is in the, is it MAP or is it M-A-P-P? It's so, M-A-P-P, but I, it's usually, I yeah. usually hear it called MAP, yeah. Okay, so in the MAP model, what would uh, go into a forces of change assessment? So um, I don't have the exact tool in front of me, so I would strongly encourage you can go on the Nature website and find all of their materials around MAP and what specifically goes into it. Um, with forces of change, it's really understanding all those external factors in your community that 
positive or negative can influence the change of an intervention. So it's understanding quite often the political environment, the larger financial environment, are there key players in your community that need to be involved? It's it's those things that can affect a change, either positive or negative, however you'd wanna see in a program, um, that may not be specific to your intervention, but can still influence the outcomes. Um, our next question is, can you speak to how these models might align with project management and the roles of project managers within public health? You know, I think there's, um, it's funny because I've actually been able to work on a couple of committees with project managers and there's definitely some overlap um, in how these models work and how project managers tend to work. Um, I think the biggest challenge is actually on how they're carried out. So I think we use a lot of the same tools. I think there's a lot of the same um, steps and processes that um, that work kind of in these models and in um, project management. Um, I would say project managers, my experience, they tend to be a lot more process focused and make sure everybody stays on task and keeps the big picture in mind sometimes than um, I've seen it done in like public health practice because we tend to get caught up in all the other things that are going on. And, and quite often the people who are trying to do project management and public health have other responsibilities. So usually it's more of a, a difference in job responsibilities and the ability to focus on actual project management step by step. Um, I will say to having worked, especially in research project management, that it can get very, very detailed Um as far as how the steps get broken down and who's responsible and how that works. And I don't know that we always get to that level of detail in public health, but we probably could learn from that. Great. Um, our next question is, you define uh, you defined reinforcing factors. Can you define predisposing and enabling factors? Yeah, so um, enabling would be like having the hookah shops on every corner. Right. That's something that enables you to make that decision to engage in hookah. Um, predisposing is that you have um, that you know you grew up with your your father using hookah, you grew up with your cousins using hookah. It's been very socially acceptable. Um, that predisposes you to engage in the behavior in the first point and to see it a little bit more positively than um, you might otherwise see it. Okay. Um, we're getting lots of comments about the PMP versus a public health <laughs> MPH. <laughs> I will say I've been I've been part of some conversations with some folks who have some, their PMP certifications, and um, you know it's it's just it's a slightly different philosophy than I've seen in practice in public health, and I don't think it's, I think we could learn a lot from the PMP mm -hmm. side of things too. So. Um, yeah, no, I think it's it, there's some important, especially being able to prepare for, to think through what could happen. I think a lot of project management, they get into preparing like, well, if this happens, then we're ready here. And if this happens, we're ready here. And if this happens, we're ready here. And I don't always know in public health that we're always able to think as far ahead as we want to and to plan as far ahead. Um, and so I think there's some definite positives that we could learn from that side of, of the professional world. Yeah. All right, so we have two more questions and then we can move to the next section. Okay. All right, so this one, are reinforcing factors in the pre-seed, proceed model also individual level? Um, Yes, they can be. So reinforcing can be that environmental, like I said, you know, hookah, um, you know, a, a hookah bar every, you know, few steps. Um, but it can also be, um, kind of the, almost the other side of that predisposing. So not only have you seen it, but, um, you know, your friends are going and smoking hookah. So that kind of reinforces you going with them. Like there's that social impact. So think, of, think a lot of how we've tried with tobacco cessation and how hard it is to get people to, to quit in part because there's that social piece of going out and smoking with your friends that is a reinforcement of that behavior. And, and that's been one of the hardest things to change. So Reinforcement can be individual level. It can also be at the environmental or system level. Okay. All right. And so our last question for now, um, we can come back and answer any other yep. ones at the end. Um, but in the case of, um, in that case, are predisposing, enabling, and reinforcing factors focused on behavior we want to change or the behavior we want someone to uptake? They can... 
they can fit with both. And so when you're really looking at behavior change, part of that is um, changing those norms that you want in your community. So that instead of being predisposed to engaging in a behavior that's unhealthy, people are predisposed to engage in a behavior that's healthy. Um, so, so an example is seatbelt use. In, in my lifetime, we've gone from where a lot of people didn't wear their seatbelts and were predisposed not to for a whole lot of reasons. There, it wasn't reinforced, um, you know, and policy changed and it, it created a, well, now we have to do it whether we want to do it, but it's gotten to where like my kids can't imagine getting in a car and not fastening their seatbelts. It's just become what you do. Mm -hmm. And so some of those factors, it takes a long time to change and to shift, but that's why you have to think about all the possible interventions. Is it an educational intervention? Is it a policy intervention? Is it, you know, something else working with the manufacturers, making, you know, seatbelts even better? Quite often it's all of those things. And so it's really thinking of multiple interventions and how they all play, interact and play with each other. Okay, great. Okay. We'll come back and try to answer more questions, but hopefully those um, helped. I, those are all good questions. Thank you. So um, we're going to talk about program evaluation. Um, I love program evaluation. So I will try to not talk too fast or be too excited about it. Um, the content outline for the for the exam, when we're talking about program evaluation, it's develop and conduct um, formative evaluation plans, develop and conduct outcome evaluation plans, develop process evaluation plans, applying qualitative evaluation methods and quantitative evaluation methods, um, and evaluating the benefits of qualitative or quantitative methods for use in evaluation. We'll talk a little bit about the the pros and cons of these different types of data in evaluation here in a couple minutes. Um, you also, part of the content is also assessing evaluation reports in relation to their quality, their utility and their impact, um, assessing program performance, utilize evaluation results to strengthen and enhance activities and programs. So again, that's part of that cycle where you're using your evaluation results to improve the program um, or to find something new um, and applying evaluation frameworks to measure the performance and impact of health programs, policies, and systems. So that's the content part of the outline for the CPH exam. So why do we evaluate our programs? Um, obviously we wanna know what's working so we continue our successes. We wanna know what isn't working so we can improve the program. And we wanna look at the impact of the program on the target community as well as the community at large. Um, one of my early jobs was actually teaching community organizations how to do their own program evaluations. And everybody was always so worried about what they said were negative evaluation results. And um, to the point where they were like writing their surveys and they were making sure to ask questions about things they were pretty sure they were doing really well on, but they weren't asking about the things that they weren't doing well on because they didn't want to have to report to funders that they weren't doing well on something. And so I am a firm believer that you want to make sure you are evaluating your program in a way that not only looks at what you're doing well, but also looks at what isn't working, that gets that kind of feedback from the people that you're serving so that you can continue to improve the program. No program is perfect. I have yet to be part of a perfect program and implementing it, a perfect policy, anything. There's always an improvement that can be made. So being honest as you're developing your program evaluation, um, to be able to do both, celebrate your successes, look at what's not working so that you can make those improvements is really important. Um, and looking at both the good and the bad really does help to build and maintain your stakeholder support and it maintains trust through accountability back to the population that you're serving. If you're only showing the good things and people aren't experiencing only the good things, then you're going to lose that trust with the community that you're seeking to serve. It also does give you a chance to um, sustain and build program resources. If you're able to go back to a funder and say, look, we're doing these things really well. We, we, we think we've got this. We know how to serve this community. We're making an impact. We can show you what's going on. But we're not doing this well. But to do this well, 
we need additional resources. We need additional funding. We need an additional staff person. We need something because we know we're falling short here and we're not falling short because we're not doing well. It's just, we don't have sufficient resources to, to do this in a way that evidence shows us um, would be most successful. So program evaluation is critical to all of these things. Um, and it's such a huge part of program sustainability. So what is program evaluation? It is the collection of information, systematic collection of information about the activities, characteristics, and outcomes of a program to make judgments about the program, improve program effectiveness, and or inform decisions about future program development. And that is straight from the CDC program evaluation guide. The important pieces of that, it is systematic. You have an evaluation plan. You know how you're gonna collect data. You're gonna collect the same data, um, sorry about that, from uh, everybody from all the participants, you know how you're going to now, you know, how you're going to um, analyze it. You know what you're going to do with it. Um, you are looking at your activities, the characteristics of the program. You're gathering information about outcomes to be able to make an evaluation of the program as a whole. There are different types of program evaluations that include formative, process, and summative, and we'll talk about those in a second. But first, because I work in an academic environment and we have this conversation all the time. I actually, I work with medical students and medical residents and I also talk about this with them because they are scared to death of evaluation because they think it's research and they think that, um, and research is a scary word. So program evaluation and research are similar in some ways. They tend to use similar data collection and analysis methods. They use surveys, they use structured interviews, they use exa existing data sets. We do similar analysis methods, whether it's you know using qualitative data methods, um, analysis methods, whether we're looking at frequencies and descriptive um, analytics, or even, you know, we're looking at some similar things. However, the most important difference is that evaluation is not intended to be generalizable. It's understanding that what we get out of our program is pretty specific to our community and our program. We may have tweaked our program. We may have taken an evidence-based model that's been researched, but we had to change it to fit our community. So we're not gonna publish this as research showing, well, now look, this intervention doesn't work because we found in our community that we didn't achieve the same success. Well, no, you're looking at an evaluation of your program um, because you had to make those changes. It doesn't mean you can't share your work. In fact, it's really important to share program evaluation work. Um, you just have to acknowledge the limitations um, and that other places shouldn't just apply what you did and think they're going to get the same thing because how you built your program or how you adapted your program is very specific to your need and to your population. Another important thing, and I am sure you guys have all seen SMART goals and SMART objectives, but we have to make sure to talk about it. These can be used to drive program evaluation and you should create them during the development of your program. Again, SMART means specific. So you're not saying we are going to um, improve access to healthcare in our community. Okay, that can mean a whole lot of different things. Are you talking about access to primary care? Are you talking weight? times to get in to see a new physician? Are you talking ED wait times? Are you talking health insurance coverage? Like you need to be specific what it is you're gonna do. It needs to be measurable. So does the data exist or can you get the data? Um, is it something we can actually measure? Um, you know, even if it's patient perception or it's community um, thoughts on something, you can measure that, you can put it all together and you find some themes or put together a scale but you have to be able to measure it in some way. You need a goal that's achievable. Saying that we are going to make sure our whole community has health insurance in the next three years, probably not achievable. I would love for it to be achievable, probably not an achievable goal. So make sure it's something that is achievable and it has to be relevant. This is where it ties into what your needs assessment says. If it's not relevant to what the needs are in your community, it's not gonna make a difference. And it needs to be time bound or time specific. So you need to say, um, you know, in the next 18 months or in the next two years or whatever that is, so that everybody agrees and understands when you're expecting to see an impact or when you're going to measure it. If you're able to create a SMART goal, it those can provide a straightforward basis for your evaluation, for your assessment, 
that can be reported to stakeholders. So it, it again, it, um, it becomes much more tangible and real, especially for your stakeholders. If you say, this is what we're going to measure. This is what we hope to see. You know, this is our SMART goal. This is our SMART objective for this program. Um, it helps to um, distill the ideas into something very tangible um, for everybody to agree upon. Okay, so types of evaluation. Formative evaluation is really that data gathered um, analysis completed before or kind of during that beginning phase of implementation. Um, so it's any feasibility testing or pilot testing that you're doing of an intervention. Maybe you've you've got this program, you think it's gonna be great, but you're not quite sure how it's gonna go in your target population. So you work with a partner and you say, we need to find 10 people from this population who could benefit from this program. We wanna try it out with them first. That would be a formative um, evaluation. It's really just, you're trying to learn as much about the pro about the program and how to actually do it than you are anything related to um, the number of participants, the number of sessions, or any of the outcomes. You'll probably try to include those participants in, in an outcome evaluation if you don't make many changes based on your formative, um, formative results. But really, it's that, okay, we want to test this before we fully launch it. Um, it is important when you're looking at evaluation and how you keep um, how you collect your evaluation data and how you analyze your evaluation data, that if you do a formative evaluation, even if you're collecting similar information from those once you've launched it, you kind of want to keep that data separate because it, it, it was slightly different circumstances. Um, and that data, while important to have and to use for the full intervention, for the launch of the full intervention, um, might not be reflective of the actual process and summative evaluation of later participants, um, particularly if you've made some pretty significant changes to the program as you've implemented it. Um, process evaluation. Again, this is the who, what, when, well, who, what, when, where, um, but it's using data to monitor how the program is being implemented and whether implementation is going to plan. So number of participants, number of sessions, um, how many sessions each participant attends, um, have you recruited enough participants to be able to gather any, you know, to really make any judgments about outcomes? Um, you know, it, it's getting some of that immediate feedback um, from, from participants um, as you go. You know, asking them, you know, how many of, you know, how many times did you exercise um, during the last week? Some of those basic reporting, like understanding that. Summative is gathering data to assess the outcomes or the benefits of the program and to draw some conclusions. So summative and outcome evaluation are often used interchangeably. Um, so summative would be, okay, we collected data and we found out that our participants between week two and week three, they were exercising on average three times a week. So now your summative evaluation is gonna be, did they continue that in, you know, once they were done with week three and they were done with the intervention? Um, how long did they continue that? Uh, if they continued exercising, did they see improvements in their blood pressure, in their A1C? Did their BMI change? So it's being able to connect what they did during the program with what happens after the program. Um, sometimes it can be a gray line of understanding what's process and what's summative, especially if you have a longer intervention, because you'll start seeing some of those changes during a program. Um, so it's really, that's where you really have to kind of identify your evaluation points in your process, um, where you expect to see change and you wanna measure at those points where you expect to see change and um, just being very clear about that. So it may be that you're expecting a little bit of change up to the first six weeks. And then after that, you expect to see bigger changes or you know, we're gonna have four weeks of, of programming Everything that happens during that is them changing their behaviors. So we're not gonna really look at outcome data until after that. Do they maintain it after our program is over? So sometimes it can be a little gray. It depends on what you're looking at, um, but typically process is kind of during your intervention and counting. It's a lot of counting and summative is typically after an intervention ends. Okay, types of evaluation data. So quantitative equals numbers. <laughs> I, 
doesn't exactly equal numbers. You can use things other than numbers, but you need to have data that can be translated into numbers. So quantitative data is closed-ended questions, ranked questions, true, false, yes, no. Um, and obviously epidemiologic data is, is quantitative data. Um, quantitative data is amazing. And there are some data sets out there that are just fun to play with. Um, quantitative data, is, it's um, in some ways it's easier. Well, no, I won't say easier. You have some policymakers, some decision makers, some people in communities who love numbers. And if you show them numbers, you show them this kind of data, they are super happy. Um, most of our scholarly journals rely a lot on quantitative data. Um, so we're all very familiar with quantitative data. I am a huge fan of qualitative data, especially when it comes to program evaluation. I think for scientific research that you're trying to replicate, you're trying to show that, yep, I got the same results. We did something, we got the same stuff. I think for research, I, I completely understand why people love quantitative data. But for me as a program evaluator, as a program planner, I absolutely love qualitative data because I think there's such a depth and a richness to what you can learn about how a program is working or not working based on the words of the people who are part of the program. And, and not only the participants of the program, but the people who are implementing the program and what barriers did they run into. Um, qualitative can be open-ended questions on surveys, so you don't have to do anything really extensive as far as focus groups or interviews with everybody, which can be very time consuming, especially if you do them and then you transcribe them and then you code them. Like there's a lot of work to qualitative data. So you can do it pretty quickly and easily with open-ended questions on surveys, um, but you can do things like focus groups and structured or semi-structured interviews um, with key stakeholders as well. A lot of program evaluations end up being mixed methods, which means you have quantitative data and then you have some qualitative that helps you to interpret the quantitative data you just collected. Okay, so data analysis and reporting. And this is why you wanna think about your program evaluation as you're creating your program. Um, they should all feed into each other. You should understand what you want to measure and what you want to learn through your evaluation, what's going to define success of an intervention so that you understand how to collect that data and then how you analyze that data. Because your data analysis should be shaped by your program goals. What is it you need to be able to say at the end of a program, at the end of your evaluation, what do you need to be able to say to determine whether or not your program was successful? Um, what do you need to know to determine what to change? in your program? How are you going to use these results? Um, who are you going to report these results to? All of that should be part of how you shape your analysis. What do your stakeholders want to know? It shouldn't just be about what you want to know, but what do your funders want to know? What does your community want to know? What does your board of commissioners want to know? Um, you need to understand your audiences when you're thinking about the analysis to make sure you are asking and collecting data on the right questions and then prepare to do the analysis so you can answer those questions. It's really important that you think about lots of different ways to share your evaluation results. How you share your results with your participants and your target community may be very different than how you share it with your stakeholders, with your board of health, with your state legislator. Um, you need to understand that there's lots of different ways to share results um, and you need to think about how you can be um, flexible in those methods. It's not just enough to put out an evaluation report and be done. It's thinking about how you, uh, you know, share that at a community meeting. How do you share it in a legislative brief with your state rep? How do you share it with the media? Um, thinking about all those different ways to share the evaluation results. And you wanna make sure that all your analysis all your data collection, all your reporting protects the identi identity of the individuals who participated in your program and who provided you with that data. Quite often, a lot of our programs are relatively small, not always, but um, especially for smaller programs when it's a very targeted specific program, you still wanna make sure you do all you can to protect the identity of the individuals who, who provided you with that data and with that information. Um, if you're not sure if you have data from enough individuals, to conduct your evaluation, you need to be transparent and say that. Um, people will be like, you know, frustrated. Sometimes you're like, why didn't you get enough data? Well, we didn't, you know, have enough participants or 
we lost participants partway through the process. And so we didn't have evaluation data from them. Um, and then you can share what you'll do differently in the future, what lesson that you've learned from that. But it's really critical, especially for maintaining the trust in your community um, to make sure you're protecting that identity. All right. So again, we close the loop. We're back to this chart. Um, program evaluation data should be used to inform your decisions going forward. That is that assess piece. You know, did you collect data that shows you should continue the intervention? That is a worthwhile investment of all the resources we have. It's benefiting our community. We have others in our community who are interested in it. There is a continued need for this intervention. Our program evaluation data shows we're doing a good job. We need to continue it. Do you need to adapt it to be more successful? You know, show, yep, we've been pretty good with the people who've been able to participate, but we're finding that there's a big chunk of our target community that hasn't been able to participate because of where we're holding the intervention. So where can we hold this intervention that maybe is more welcoming, more accessible, open at different times? Where else could we have this intervention that um, helps us to reach a larger population? Do we need to adopt a new intervention? We go, you know what? Our community still have an important, still experiencing this need. This intervention, whether it had some success or not, for some of the participants, it's not enough to say we need to stick with this. And we think there's better options out there. So let's look at a new intervention. Um, or has the need gone away? Do you still need an intervention? Um, you know, it's it, it's been an interesting discussion with some of the folks that I've worked with around um, how HIV AIDS education has changed. And at times there have been different questions about do we still need um, what we've had? Do we still need an intervention at all? Now, of course, the numbers are still going up. We still have new cases. So usually that goes away, but you know, as, as medications change, as people are uh, HIV, HIV positive, but undetectable, it's really had, there've been times where it's like, do we still need an intervention? How have things changed? So, you know, hopefully, you know, the end goal, you would love to say, you know, at our community, the, all of those needs that we identified, they've been met. So we don't need an intervention anymore. I wish that happened more often. <laughs> it doesn't happen often enough, but you know that's an important question to ask. Do we still need this intervention in our community? Okay. So I know we've got lots of time, but we're gonna go through the practice questions and then hopefully we have more than enough time for everybody's possible questions. So practice question number four, which of the following statements is correct in reference to program planning. Ten more seconds. All right, the correct answer is number four, that action plans help groups specify how objectives will be accomplished. Um, number one, needs assessments are are really the first thing that you're doing if you're planning a new program. Um, they're not done midway, you're doing other types of evaluations, but usually not a needs assessment. Um, vision statements are usually, um, are typically not exact. <laughs> they give, again, they give a vision, they give a broad idea of what it is that your group's gonna do, but they're not necessarily specific or exact. And the tricky part about answer number three, it says that process objectives describe what your final project outcome should be. Process objective, describe how the, the project will be carried out. So a process objective is we will provide this intervention to at least 50 members of this community. That's not an outcome. The outcome looks at the actual impact on those participants. A process objective is how many people will be reached. Okay. Ah, okay, sorry. 
Question or practice question number five, waiting until a program or intervention is complete to begin evaluation activities misses important and valuable opportunities for which type of evaluation? Ten more seconds. Again, you guys did a great job. So process evaluations, the correct answer is number three. If you wait until a program or intervention is done, you're gonna miss um, some opportunities to conduct your process evaluation. Um, process evaluations are done during um, the implementation because it really is assessing the process of implementation. How, um, you know, was the, inter was the intervention implemented in fidelity with the model that you're using? Um, how many people attended an individual session? Um, you know, what did uh, participants think of each, you know, each intervention or each session that was provided? Um, you can, so a summative evaluation is another word for an outcome evaluation. So you can do that at the end of a, a program or an intervention. Similar with an impact evaluation, you can, you can usually collect some data from participants or look at larger community data to see the impact of the program after it's done. Um, and you actually can do some participant evaluation once a program is done as well. Although it's not as good evaluation data because it's a lot of recall quite often and how they felt about it. Um, okay, so practice question number six. Sorry for the words. A health department implemented a new marketing strategy to increase flu vaccination rates. The evaluation shows there was an overall increase except in the local Hispanic population. Which evaluation method will best collect the information needed to understand this outcome in the community? I'll leave this one open for a minute and a half. Yeah, <laughs> it's lots of words. Yeah. All right, you have about 15 more seconds. Job. So the correct answer is number two of all those options. Um, it would be best to collect information from leaders and healthcare providers in the local Hispanic community. Um, ideally, you are interviewing individuals who um, are as close to, if you're not able to talk to the individuals that you're trying to reach, which would be members of the Hispanic community, you wanna to talk to the people who work most closely with them, which would be leaders in that community and hopefully the healthcare providers who can give you some insight on why members of that community maybe are refusing um, vaccine if they're coming in and offering it. Um, talking to colleagues in other jurisdictions, uh, you know, it's never bad to do that, but I wouldn't rely on that um, for um, making a decision about what to do differently in your community. It's nice to hear from your colleagues, but your community, even you know, your, it, your Hispanic community is going to be different than another jurisdiction's Hispanic community. Just every um, population's got a different personality. There's just, there's these little intangible differences. Um, and so while it might be helpful to find out what worked, 
Um, I wouldn't rely on that. Um, similar with meeting colleagues to discuss their observations, like it's important to learn from them. Hey, what have you run into? What barriers have you encountered? Maybe, you know, what have you learned? But it's still kind of second and third hand observation um, and won't give you as, as direct information as what you would like to have. And nationwide data, while again, it can be helpful and informative, isn't probably going to give you the insights that you need for your local community. One thing I want to say before we just move on to questions that um, this question always reminds me of, and, and I apologize for not having it in a slide. As you're developing your evaluation instruments, it's really important to have those community partners as part of the process of developing evaluation instruments, whether it's helping to craft survey questions, develop focus group or interview questions, to think through the analysis. Um, because you want to make sure that you're asking things, you're asking your questions in a way that is most likely to get um, candid, honest, complete data. And so if you are engaging those community members and your partners in the development of all your evaluation tools and in your analysis and in the interpretation of the results, um, you're, you're most likely to get use, really usable, really fantastic information. Um, doing all this work with your community partners and then you come up with the survey tool um, is probably not gonna be as productive, even though it's it can be easier because it's just like, let me just use the survey. But you always wanna get some feedback on, on the instruments that you're gonna use with your target population. And in particular, when you're talking about communities where language um, could be a challenge, could be a barrier to completion of evaluations, um, making sure that you're asking questions that not only are respectful and will get the answers that you want, but if you do a translation that you have members of that community actually read through the translations for you to make sure that they are um, saying what you want them to say. So with that, we'll see what questions we have. All right. This is how good. my kids look at me all the time. So <laughs> I was smiling. I like the the graphic. <laughs> I know. I need to put this as my background on my computer, but it's how my kids yeah. look at me all the time. So hopefully <laughs> I can answer some more questions. All right. So um one of the questions it has it's referencing um question uh, practice question number five, but um it's asking what's the difference between the impact evaluation and process evaluation? Yeah, so impact evaluation is um Okay, so process evaluation is looking at how the program was actually implemented. So typically you're looking at um, the number of participants. If you're doing multiple sessions, it's how many participants participate in all sessions or at least 75% of sessions, or um, it's looking at a lot of participant evaluations. How did you feel about this presenter? What would you change about how we did this piece of this um, program? So process evaluation is really looking at the how um, and the how much, like they met for 90 minutes and they, you know, covered this information. Impact evaluation is um, more looking at the impact of a program, whether it's on participants or on the larger community. So it's, um, it's after the program has been implemented and it's usually looking not at individual participant outcomes, but at a larger impact um, whether it's, your, you know, we had the local Hispanic community um, or I've been involved in some where we're looking like at our school community. So um, in providing um, Michigan Changes Policy recently where we, we actually now have free breakfast and lunch for all of our students. So we can look at the individual benefits for students those who maybe were who are food insecure, but now we're also looking at what's the larger impact on all of our schools. Um, are we seeing any differences in attendance at schools? Are we seeing any um, differences in um, referrals for like behavior issues or things where people where students aren't paying attention? You know, like we're trying to we're actually trying to figure out what some of those measures are going to be, but it's looking at the larger impact which is very different than the process of how it's been implemented. Um, the next question is, can adjustments be made at, um, at the process evaluation? Yes, but if you, so 
let's say you're doing a program for three months and you're getting back all this process evaluation. And what you're seeing is we really don't like being at this event at 5.30 at night because we're all hungry and there's no food. That's legitimate. And you can say, okay, either we're going to change the time or we need to find money to provide some food because everybody's hungry at 5.30 and we're not providing them dinner and we're not going to get people paying attention and they're not going to come back. And yes, you can make that change. What you want to do is if you make that change, just kind of note it in um, and however you're kind of recording the implementation of the project. So when you do your evaluation report, you can say on this date, we decided to change our approach. And so you kind of do all the evalu process evaluations beforehand on that particular, you know, on that program. And then you do your evaluations after and you note the reason for the break is because you made a change in the program. But yeah, I, I strongly advise, don't wait until the end to make a change. If you see something like right away that like, we need to, to fix this or this is gonna fail. Um, then the next question, are there any standard Oh, sorry. Let me start over. <laughs> are there any standardized needs assessment models or tools? Um, there are lots. Um, <laughs> CDC has a bunch of resources. Um, NACHO, so the National Association of City and County Health Officials, has a bunch of tools, particularly related to the community health needs assessment and the CHIPS, the community health improvement plans. Um, those are the first two that pop in right off of my head, but there are lots of organizations out there that um, that support public health um, or support public health professionals that will have resources. Um, there are also models in other um, professions. I, I work in a medical school. We do needs assessments all the time, often with our community partners. So if you look in healthcare, there's also examples there. Um, so sometimes it's, um, narrowing down the list. Like if you Google needs assessments, you're going to come up with a lot of hits. So I would recommend starting with some public health professional associations or organizations and starting there. Um, then this next one, what is a participant evaluation? Like participant opinions, like usability surveys or participant knowledge change evaluation? Both. It can be both. But usually with a part, participant evaluation, you're either asking for their feedback on the program, you know, did they like it, they didn't like it. Um, you're asking for change in knowledge. You're asking something specific to the participant. Um, it can be outcome or it can be process. So you can do it, you can do participant evaluations, but it's very specific to that individual and it's their evaluation of kind of what was provided to them or what the, what the impact was. Uh, then thinking about all the many models for planning, can you briefly cover the patch, apex, and map it models? So I probably could. Um, they're all, so part of why I don't, I haven't included specifics is that those models were used um, and have been kind of phased out as other models have come into to practice. Um, so, um, patch and apex, apex were previous models, um, that were very similar to map and to map 2.0, um, but that they kind of evolved and became map and map 2.0. So I put them on there because you'll sometimes still see them referred to in the literature. Um, but they're really not used much anymore. Um. But if anybody's interested, you can Google them and, and find them. So they're they're really similar to MAP. It's just they have some different kind of um, uh, some of those forces of change and some of those other assessments aren't necessarily part of those models. Um, then this one goes back to your first section. Um, in regards to practice question number two, how do you decide on an intervention based on strength of evidence that desires change can be achieved without having intervention implemented. Okay, hold on. It's the Keep first question in the, the Q and A section. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so can you read it again? Just cause I wanted to pull up the question. I pull up yeah. the question. Yeah. yeah. In regards to practice question two, yep. how do you decide on an intervention based on strength of evidence that the desired change can be achieved without having the intervention implemented. So if, so 
And that's a fair question. So if you don't have an evidence, an intervention with any kind of evidence base, you're trying to create something brand new because you haven't found anything out there that fits your need, that fits your community, that somebody else has tried. Um, then that that shows you you don't have the strength of the evidence. So then you would look at other considerations. Um, but the first thing you really want to look at is do we do we have a reasonable expectation that what we're going to do is going to achieve the change that we want? Um, and and how strong is that evidence? Um, it's part of why I encourage a lot of my public health partners, like I always want them to go to conferences, to write articles. They all look at me like we're community people. We don't write articles. You've been in academia too long, Molly. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, it's because even a local program evaluation of a program contributes to the evidence. Something you've done before, let's say you've done a program before and it has worked for African-American women in your community and you think there's a reasonable chance it's gonna work for Hispanic women in your community. You have some evidence. You have a, a reasonable expectation based on the evidence that you have that what you've done before in this community is gonna work in this community. Um, but you don't want to worry about budget and worry about what your project sponsor thinks and worry about the individual interests of teams. Y you need to worry about, do we have some, some proof, some reason, some impartial evidence that shows that what we think we're gonna, what we're gonna do should work. So even if you don't have evidence, you're just making it up off the top of your head. Well, that means you don't have evidence, but that shows that at least the strength of your evidence is pretty close to zero. And then you think about other things, but it's the first thing you need to consider. I hope that made sense. Yeah. Um, okay. So the next one is, is there any link between program evaluation and implementation science? Ooh, good question. Um, Yes. Um, again, it, it, it goes a little bit to that, um, the difference between evaluation and research. Um, so it really is, is your goal to create, to have data that can be more generalizable to other communities to other environments? Do you want to show your local health system that what we did at our clinic, you can do at yours? Like, is it more generalizable or is it something to improve your program? Um, but implementation science really is very similar to evaluation um, once you get beyond like the, that idea of scope and intent. So there are a lot of similarities. Okay, it looks like we have one last question. So for the last practice exam question, when would it be appropriate to compare your data in uh, your data in national data for other trends? So I think it's always, um, I think, um, I was gonna say always, and I shouldn't, I never say always, I should know better than that. Um, if you have what you feel like is a pretty, you know, good data set locally, um, and you feel like it matches up with a national data set as far as, are we looking at the same things? Are we trying to measure the same things? Are we doing the analysis in the same way? Because the devil's in the detail when you're comparing findings from two different data sets, right? And they may have collected it a little bit different, or they have a breakdown of, you know, their age groups a little bit differently, or, you know, it, it kind of depends on, on how, um, how comparable your data that you have locally is to however they've set up that national data set. Um, I don't think it hurts if you feel like you've got pretty comparable data. I think it can, can help you understand, is this just our issue or is it something more nationally? So is it just our local Hispanic population that seems to be reticent to, to get the flu vaccine? Or is this something that we're seeing across our state or across our region or across the country? Um, because I think that then informs um, maybe what your intervention is, because maybe it's now not something that's just specific to your community. Maybe this is something bigger and um, that might change how you collect information from the community or the questions that you ask from the community. So I think it gives perspective if you can compare it in a way that's fair. Okay. 
Well, that looks like that's the end of our questions today. So, well, thank you guys. I really appreciated um, being here. I appreciate your time. I wish you all the best of luck as you prepare uh, for the exam and get ready to take the exam. I hope um, in the future, if I get a chance to meet any of you, that you're got your little CPH pin like I do, and I get to celebrate that with you. So, thank you all so very much. Yeah. Thank you all. And I hope to see you back here on Thursday for our leadership session. Thank you. And thank you especially to Molly for being here.